If you're trying to relate to God based on you keeping all of these rules, you can't pick and choose which ones you're going to keep. You got to keep them all or nothing. It's an all or nothing deal. That's what we're talking about today, and I think that this is going to help you, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm concluding my first week of ministry on the true nature of God. And I tell you, I'm excited about this. This is something that just revolutionized my life. You know, I know that we've got a lot of new listeners. We just went on a new television station in Los Angeles this week, and we've just gone on in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And there's a lot of new listeners, and some of you haven't heard this. But I was born again when I was eight. I was raised in a church. I sought the Lord my entire life. But after I got born again at eight, I fell into the trap of thinking that God was going to love me and bless me and answer my prayers based on how well I performed. And so I got on the, to the religious treadmill of trying to do everything perfectly. I've never said a word of profanity, never taken a drink of liquor, never smoked a cigarette, never tasted any of those things, you know, that were taboo and all of this. I've never even... I uh, drank coffee. I mean, I lived a super holy life. But I fell into the trap of trusting my goodness as the foundation of God moving in my life. And because of it, I was frustrated. I wasn't seeing any power manifest. My dad died just a few days after I'd turned 12 years old, and I prayed for him, and yet he wasn't healed. And uh, I was around a number of people who were, died very close to me before I was 18 years old. And I just wasn't seeing the power of God manifest in my life. And it was because I was trying to earn it. Now, I don't know that I would have said that if you'd have asked me, but that's what was going on. I thought that God loved me proportional to how well I performed. When I did well, then I could expect God to do something. When I did poorly, I could expect God not to answer my prayer or even punish me. And so that's the mindset that I had. But then on March the 23rd, 1968, I had this encounter where God just revealed his love to me, and I mean in a moment's time, my whole life changed. And one of the main things that happened was I knew that God's love for me was not based on any worth or value in my life. God didn't love me because I was lovely, but because he was love. And it became an instant revelation. I knew it. But everything in my life up until that time, all of my understanding of the Bible, Scripture, everything I knew about God was that God loved me and related to me proportional to my performance. That's what I had been taught. That's the way I had God pictured. And yet my experience with Him that night was totally different. And it took me approximately 20 years I know some of you are going to think, man, that's a long time. I guess maybe I'm a slow learner or whatever. But it took me nearly 20 years to reconcile that experience that I had where I knew that God's love was unconditional with what I saw in the Scripture. I would see glimpses and pieces of it. But I just overall couldn't understand how a holy God could love an unholy me and how that God can answer my prayers when I didn't deserve it. And that mindset came from the Old Testament scriptures. And it took me about 20 years to learn the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And it has liberated my life. It has totally changed the way that I think. It has opened up the Word of God to me and made it much clearer and much more of an impact upon my life. And I believe it will do the exact same thing for you. So I'm saying all of these things to say that this teaching I'm giving on the true nature of God is really a harmony between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, an explanation of where we are and which covenant we're living under. And if you could get this same revelation, just from my own personal experience, I believe it would do for you. If it does for you what it's done for me, it would just revolutionize your life. This would change you. You know, I know that there are many of you 
that really do love God, and you know that God loves you, but in a practical way, you don't experience that love. You believe that God's upset, that He's disappointed with you, you're disappointed with yourself, and you, you feel God's displeasure. And yet, out of the other side of your mouth, you'll say, oh yes, God loves me. And so there's this paradox here. And you need this reconciled. You can't really have a good relationship with God if you think that he's ticked off. You know, just put it down into human terms, relationships that we can understand. If you had a person, let's say it's your husband, your wife, your father, your mother, some person that you were on a day-to-day -day relationship with, and if that person was so strict and so harsh that every time you did anything wrong, I mean anything wrong, not only actions, but just your thoughts, and not only the thoughts, you know, that you shouldn't have, but thoughts that you should have that you were failing to have. If somebody knew you enough that they could evaluate you on every thought, on every emotion, every action, and if that person was there every time you did something wrong, say, this is wrong, you're wrong, how dare you do this, stop this, stop that. If there was a person that just nitpicked with you over every thought, every action, every emotion in the natural realm, I can guarantee you, you would not be friends with them very long. You would avoid that person you would get away with, from them because you just can't tolerate that. And yet, in a sense, that's the way that God has been presented, that God is there telling us every time we do something wrong. And you know what? That has been the reason that a lot of people don't really focus on God very much because the God that they have had explained to them, they are condemning themselves in the name of the Lord, thinking that it's God doing it. And it just drives you from God. I've been sharing all of this week that we are now under a different covenant. There was a period of time where God did make us aware of our sins. The knowledge of sin came through the law. And the law was given to amplify the transgression and to make sin look so bad that it would make us guilty and guilt-ridden. Romans chapter 3 says that. It was given to condemn us, to shut our mouth, to destroy us to kill us, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That's what the law was given for. And yes, there was a period of time that God did those things. But now the law has ceased to have dominance over us, and we have a new covenant, the new covenant with Jesus. It's called the gospel. And God is no longer imputing our sins unto us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19. Let me share a couple of scriptures with you out of uh, Galatians chapter 3 where the Apostle Paul is making these same points. In Galatians chapter 3, in verse 9, it says, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And if you were to take this in its context, the whole book of Galatians is countering the Old Testament law, and it was using the term law to refer to the law of Moses, all the rules and regulations, and it was using the word faith to describe the covenant that was made with Abraham 430 years before the law was given to Moses. And it's made this point that the law was a secondary thing. The first way that God dealt with people was by grace through faith, and that's what he's talking about. So when he says in verse 9, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, he's contrasting and basically saying it's not those who keep all of these rules and regulations, but it's those who establish relationship with God through faith that receive the blessing that Abraham got. In verse 10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Man, that is a powerful scripture. And again, most people, when they say things like, I believe we've got to keep the law. I believe we're still under the law. I believe that we are supposed to do all of these precepts of the law today. People who say that don't even know what they're saying. For one thing, this is a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 27. I believe it's verse 27, Deuteronomy 27, 27. It's the very last verse of Deuteronomy anyway. And in Deuteronomy chapter 27, he had just divided the people up into two groups. He put one group on Mount Ebal, the other group on Mount um, Gerizim, I believe it was. And 
one, uh, half of the people read off all of the curses that would come upon you if you didn't keep the law. Half of the people read off all of the blessings. And then they ended by making this statement that was quoted here. It says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Did you know that even though there were blessings that were under the Old Testament law, Nobody could actually ever obtain the blessings because this verse says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things. You know in the Greek what this word all means? It means all. It means the exclusion of none. It includes everything. And this is the reason that nobody got the blessing because you know what? Even though you might live better than I've lived or better than somebody else, who wants to be the best sinner that ever inherited the curse? None of us have ever kept everything perfectly. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so as people who are trying to live under the law and say, but I believe you've got to do this. Don't you hear what the law is saying? It says you're cursed if you don't do them all. It's not a matter of, you know, do 99 out of 100 or make 80 out of 100 and it's a passing grade. You either do 100 out of 100 or if you miss one single precept, you fail. You are rejected. You are cursed. God doesn't grade on a curve. He doesn't just take the top certain percentage and say, well, you weren't perfect, but you were the best in the class, and so therefore I'll answer your prayers. You've either got to be perfect or... You need to put faith in a Savior who is perfect for you. And this is what it's saying. Don't you understand what the law says? The law doesn't say keep the most you can, and if you hit at least 70%, well, then that's a passing grade. No, you've either got to keep them all, or if you break them, any of them, you come under the curse of the law. Man, these are some strong statements. So I was sharing out of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You know, it's amazing how people who sit there and say, I believe you've got to live holy, and if you don't do certain things, God won't bless you. It's amazing that when you really sit down and talk to them, you could say, so are you perfect? Do you do everything right? Do you not have any sin in your life? And they'll... I mean, nearly invariably, they'll say, well, no, I'm not perfect, but at least I don't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. At least I'm living holier than this person. See, that's the way the Pharisees were. That's the Pharisee syndrome. People who sit there and say that you've got to keep the law, they wouldn't, they wouldn't ever proclaim that they have kept the law perfectly. What they're doing, in a sense, is trying to mix law and grace. They're saying you have to do everything that you can and then ask God to make up the difference. But that's not what the Bible teaches. In uh, Romans chapter 11, let me turn over and read this passage to you. I believe it's in Romans chapter 11 and in verse 6. It says, uh, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, that may sound a little wordy to you, but this is just old English way of saying you're either saved by grace without works or you're saved by works without grace, but not a combination of the two. If it's truly grace, then works can't be in it. If it's truly works, then grace can't be in it. It's one or the other, but not a combination of the two. Here's another verse that goes along with this. is in James chapter 2 and verse 10. And it says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point becomes guilty of all. Man, that's a strong statement. If you keep the whole law and yet offend in one single point, you become guilty of all. Did you know that the law is much more than just the Ten Commandments? But every one of us have broken the Ten Commandments. You don't have to go much further than that. But there's literally thousands of commandments. Did you know if you're wearing a garment that has part polyester and part cotton in it, you broke the law? Did you realize that if you haven't got a banister built around your upstairs deck and if somebody gets hurt, you broke the law? And on and on and on. Most people don't even know what the laws are. And yet they're sitting there, I believe we've got to keep them. And so what they're saying in a sense is you've got to do them the best you can because everybody admits we can't keep them completely. But if you will do the best you can, then God will make up the difference. 
Nope, that's not what the Bible says. Again, James 2.10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of everything. It's just like if I had a huge glass in front of me and you, it wouldn't matter if you shoot a BB through that glass or if you drive a truck through the glass and break the whole thing. It's one piece and the whole thing has to be replaced. That's the way that God's law is. It's not made up of 6,000 different individual commandments. It's one command that has 6,000 parts to it, but it's all one thing. And if you mess up in one thing, it's just like breaking the whole thing. The whole thing has been violated. I have never committed adultery. I've never murdered. I've never stolen. I've never done these things. But you know what? Because I have been selfish and because I have put myself ahead of God and I've been angry and I've done all of these other things. You know, I'm guilty of murder, adultery, lying, stealing, because it's all one precept. I'm guilty. If I try and stand before God based on my own goodness, I'd be rejected. And so would you. And this is what the law is out to do. The law is out to show you your sin and to show you that you can't stand before God based on your own goodness and make you come to God through faith. But it's amazing how Christians have tried to mix the two together and say, well, yeah, you need faith, but you've also got to do this, this, and this. Nope. It's either your faith in Jesus or your faith in yourself, but not a combination of the two. And those are some strong statements. And I can hear television sets all around the world clicking off right now because people, this is violating your religious traditions but I don't know how you can argue with it violating the Word of God. This is exactly what the Scripture is saying. You're cursed if you don't continue in every, all of the commandments which are written. That's what it says. So uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, it says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Boy, that verse 12 is a strong passage. It says the law is not of faith. You put that together with Romans chapter 14, verse 23, where it says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And you'll find out that trying to relate to God by keeping the commandments of the Old Testament law is sin for the New Testament believer. It's not of faith. And it's sin. It's missing the mark. You may be living a very holy life. You may never dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. You may be as straight as a gun barrel and twice as empty. Amen. But you know what? If you are trusting in those good things as the reason that God is going to move in your life, then that's not a faith. That's a law mentality, and that's sin. That's missing it. Well, those are strong statements. But you know what? Our religious culture today has so perverted what the true gospel is. We have tied God's love and acceptance and answer of our prayers to our performance so tightly that there's a lot of people that just cannot abide what I'm saying. But all I'm doing is expounding on what Scripture is saying. The law is not of faith, period. There is no other way to look at this. The law and faith are not the same things. And we are justified by faith in the sight of God. That's what it says up here in um, verse 6. It says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him righteous, for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of God. Verse 9, So then we, uh, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Not those which be of the law, but those which be of faith. It says in verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. All of this is talking about how that we no longer relate to God through performance and keeping rituals and rules and regulations. But now it's just by faith in what Jesus has done for us. You know, just for time's sake, I'm going to skip down and, and look at some other uh, scriptures. Look in verse 18. It says, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? In other words, this is a logical uh, question. 
He'd been teaching about that we aren't under the law. The law wasn't made for us. Well, then the question comes up, well, then why did God give it? What was the purpose of the law? Look at this. It says it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And um, it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. It was until the seed should come. And if you go back to verse 16, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, singular, which is Christ. So verse 16 says that the seed of Abraham is Christ. And if you go back down to um, this verse we were just reading, the law was ordained until the seed should come. That's talking about Christ. But now that Christ has come, the kingdom of heaven is preached. Look at this. It says that the law and the prophets were until John, but since that time the kingdom of heaven is preached, and the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And so the law only operated up until the time of John. When Jesus came, he brought grace and truth, not law. The law was only temporary, is what all of this is saying. And so in verse 21, it says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there could have been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be unto them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Man, that's a great picture. The law shut us up. It's like if you were trying to go down this road and says, maybe this is the way to have a relationship with God. There's the law telling you, nope, you've fallen short. So you go down this road. There's a the law telling you no. So you go that way. There's a the law saying no. You go this way. Here's the law. The law just hemmed you in. It boxed you in so that the only way you could look was up. That was the purpose of the law, was to make you despair of ever earning relationship with God based on your own goodness. And it's amazing how religion has turned this around, and instead of using the law for the purpose it was given for, which is to show you that you can't please God based on your own performance, the religion has come along and said, here's what you've got to do to please God, do all of these steps. That's not the reason that the law was given. It wasn't given so that you could keep it and obtain right relationship with God. It was given to show you how incapable of ever earning relationship with God you are so that you would quit this self-righteousness and this concept of trying to earn God's favor and you just humbled yourself and receive it as a gift. Man, that's good news. That's nearly too good to be true news, but that's the gospel.